Acts chapter 7 is where you should be this morning in the Bible. If you'll notice, Acts chapter 7 is right at 60 verses long. It starts out in Acts chapter 7. I'll give you a little bit of time to get comfortable. And uh, in Acts chapter 7, it starts out with uh, Stephen having to answer some charges made by what the Bible calls suborn men. Uh, that's what the Bible calls them. In East Texas, we just call them a bunch of liars. That's what we call them. We just get down to business. And, uh, and so the a bunch of liars get together. They lie about Stephen. And Stephen ends up in Acts chapter 7 being stoned to death. While the infamous Saul is standing there, and then Acts chapter 8, if you kind of want to let your eyes drift to Acts chapter 8, the Bible tells us that now Saul uh, picks up the mantle, if you will, of the persecution of Christians. He consents, uh, which simply means he was there, and he gave his uh, approval of uh, Stephen being stoned. And so Saul kind of picks it up and goes from there. The entire chapter 7... Stephen starts going into the history of God's people. Now, this is very important that we get this foundation. They start going into the history of God's people. In verse number 39, if you'll look at it, he says something very interesting about the children of Israel. In verse 39, he says this, In their hearts, turn back again into Egypt. Think about this. We all know the story how God delivers the children of Israel from Egypt. We all know the plagues, and we all are very familiar with the plagues. God delivers his children. God leads his children out, and they're running from the armies of Pharaoh. They get to the Red Sea. God parts the Red Sea. They cross over on dry ground. When they get on the other side of the Red Sea, they truly now are out of bondage. They are in no fear. Listen very closely. They're in no fear of the army behind them. But a different kind of fear takes over. That fear of this, are you ready? What does the future hold? That fear of we now are in the wilderness. We now do not know what the future holds. So because we don't know what the future holds, here was the thinking of the children of Israel. Because we don't know what the future holds, it would be better for us and here's the sermon. If you miss it, you're going to miss the whole thing. It would be better for us to go back to the security of bondage than it would be to go forward in faith with the God Almighty. If I have had a nickel for every time, I have tried to let Christians know bondage is not where you want to be. It would be better for you to live in the fear of the future with an almighty God who can part the Red Sea in the future like he did the Red Sea back here than it would be to go back to a taskmaster who made life miserable. Don't let time dim the bondage that you and I were under when we had a bad taskmaster back there. And I think the pulpits of America need to tell God's people there are going to be weak heart moments that you truly will think to yourselves, was I better off without God? Was I better off back there in bondage? Was I better off not tithing? Was I better off spending the Sundays on the lake? Was I better off not even getting into this God thing? And there are Christians who walk through the doors of our churches every single week because they've had a rough day and because they've had a rough week in this world that the devil truly makes them believe in, them, in their hearts. Maybe I should just stop this church thing. If you and I can get past those weak moments in our heart, when we second guess, are we on the right track? Are we going the right way? Oh, I can see it in sometimes in people's faces. They'll give me a handshake and they'll say, hello, pastor. And they'll say, I'm having a great day. But I can tell in their spirit that they've had a rough week. And now they're thinking to themselves, should I even continue down this path? The children of Israel left Egypt. And in verse number 34, if you look at verse 34, back up a couple of verses. In verse 34, Stephen, when he's talking about the bondage, and he's talking about what they were in. Look how he says it in verse 34. Look at it. I have seen, I have seen the what? Affliction. Do you hear that? I have seen the what? Affliction. 
Nobody lives for the devil and nobody lives in this world without having affliction. Do you know what makes people want God? They're tired of the life they live. You know why people want and need church? Because they're so tired of where they're at. This week I had the opportunity to go visit with a dear couple. And as I was talking to them and, 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 and I was at the front door and I was taking the Bible and I was showing them about the Lord Jesus Christ, I said to them, why are you reaching out to the pastor now? And listen to what they said. They said, because we are tired of living the way we've been living. And I said, tell me about the way you've been living. And they said, we fight all the time. We're miserable. We are angry. We can't overcome addictions. We can't stop the insanity. And something's got to be better than the life that we're living. Listen to me. There is something better than that kind of life. And it is found inside the Lord Jesus Christ. So people who are living in the affliction, look what it says also in this verse. He says, I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt, and I have heard their what? Groanings. Again, please listen to me. People who are in bondage, they groan on the inside. They're not happy on the inside. But then when God does deliver them and they come out, then here's the fear. Are you ready? that they'll get into this journey and then they'll say to themselves, we were better off back there in bondage. If you're here today, and I'm talking to a select group, if you're here today and you're thinking to yourself, I would have been better off if I had never started this journey with God. Don't think that. Don't think that. If you're a teenager here right now, and maybe you're graduating this year, or maybe you have a couple of years to graduate, and you're thinking to yourself, our family would have been better off if we had never started this journey. And when I'm done with school, I'm out of this God scene, and I'm out of this church thing. I'd be better off living in the world. Oh, please listen to me. Don't live in the world. And you adults that would amen me and would, say, would cheer on the preacher this morning would let everybody around you know that preacher up there knows exactly what he's talking about. There is nothing in this old wicked world that our young people ever need to embrace and wrap around. And if God has delivered you, don't go back. Oh, don't go back. Don't go back. You say, Pastor, how do I keep at that weak moment in here from going back. There are three things I want to give you. They're found right in this chapter. Look at Acts chapter 7, verse 39. To whom our fathers would not ob obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into, what's that word? Egypt. First thing I want to tell you is this. Write it down. Cut the relationship with Egypt so there's no place to go back to. So how do I not go back? Cut the relationship with Egypt. Burn the bridge. Delete the number. Take the address out of your address book. Delete the email address. Don't associate with bondage. Don't associate with the garlics. Don't associate with the leeks. Because if you have no reference point when you're having a tough time, you'll have no place to go back to when you have a tough time. I think it's insanity for those who struggle with, with alcohol to go sit in a bar and drink a Coke. I think it's insanity for those who struggle with drugs to hang out with the drug dealer. I think it's wrong for those who have a pornography problem for them to hang out in front of HBO. Listen to me very closely. If you don't want to go back to Egypt, then don't have any relationship with Egypt, and you won't go back to Egypt. That's why you want to keep your marriage together. Guys, get rid of your old girlfriend's telephone number. My wife wanted me to say that today. Okay, and uh, listen to me. Cut the relationship. I found this to be very interesting. You say, Pastor, how far away from Egypt do I need to go to where I'll never turn back to Egypt? When I studied the time frame, and there's a varied amount of days that, that the scholars would tell us, but from the time they left Egypt at Passover... Till the time they got to Mount Sinai, that this is referenced to in Acts chapter 7, it was somewhere between 47 and 55 days. Some are very accurate and very convinced that it's 52 days. 
Some are very convinced, no, pastor, because of the Jewish calendar, it is 48 days. But I can tell you this, listen to me, they were marching along in victory. They were marching along having seen God deliver them, having seen the pillar and the cloud lead them, having turned around and saw the Red Sea parted, and then watching the armies of Pharaoh as they got to the other side, and they watched their God bring the waters in. They saw their God do some great things. And then when they get to 50-something days into this journey, it was then that the fear gripped their souls. And they said, Oh, we need to go back to Egypt. And if that's not the Christian life, I don't know what the Christian life is. Because we can experience victory and experience victory and see God move and see God move and see God move. And it may be 10 years into this journey. It may be 15 years into this journey. It may be 40 years into this journey. But you listen to me. The further you can get away from Egypt and the less bridges you've got back to Egypt, when you fear, you have no place to look but up. Let's cut out the insanity. Let's get away from the world. We don't want our children having any place to run when they get scared about the future. Do I think that they really wanted to go back to Egypt if they truly thought about the afflictions and the groanings? You know what I truly think? I truly think it was the last reference place that they had for security. Think about this. They went from dwelling in houses in a land of Goshen to now walking and marching. You may be saved a long time, but I've seen mature Christians bail on God. Because you get scared. How do you make it past a weak moment? Cut all the bridges back to Egypt. Remember how bad the bondage was. Was Better for you to move forward in fear than to go back to the past in bondage. Second thing, if you could say, how do I make it past the weak heart and moments to where I fear about going forward with God? Are you ready? Strengthen your relationship with the Word and the church. Strengthen your relationship with the Word and and with the church. Look at verse 38. Can you kind of go back, if you don't mind, to the verse right before that? Look at verse 38 and look at what it said. This is he that was in the church in the what? Wilderness with the angels which spake to him in the Mount Sinai, Sinai and with our fathers who received the what? Lively oracles to give unto us. I want you to notice this. That the order here, that in the Old Testament, Moses went to the mountain to get the law. Why don't you think with me now? And then he brought back the law. Twice. Here, it talks about the lively oracles before. You know what? Listen to me. God is so good. That he not only gives us the lively oracles in the book, but he gives us the living author on the inside. How do I make it past the weak heart moments? Listen, look at it. Look at it. You see that right there? You hold it in your lap. You better have a daily dose of that word right there. Because when you come to the point to where you think, I can't do this anymore, and I don't want to do this anymore, when you teenagers think, well, it'd be better off if I go to the world, when you husbands think, it'd be better off if I never got into this family, your wives think, what am I doing here? Why am I even trying? Listen to me. If you don't want to go back to Egypt and you don't want to ruin your life, you get you a strong relationship with that book right there and with the church you're a member of. That's why don't miss one church service. Don't miss it. Tonight at 6 o'clock, you say, well, I'm not even graduating. I don't even have a family member graduating. Yes, I know that, and that may be true, but we're going to open up the Word of God, and we're going to preach about the Holy One of Israel, and you just may get something to put on the inside of you that just may help you at the day you think about quitting. Boy, we're going in the summertime. Don't quit in the next three months. Don't give up on God in the next three months. Well, I could just get out of it. No, you're not getting out of it because you're always taking you with you. But everybody has that weak moment in here that they truly feel like, I should not even have done this. 
Listen to me. How do you make it past? Are you ready? Cut the bridges so there's no place to go back to. Number two, strengthen your relationship with the Word of God and the church. Number three is where I wanted to get to. I think the number one reason that people go back to a lifestyle that they used to live is because of what is found in verse 40. Look at Acts chapter 7 in verse 40. How do I make it pass, Pastor? That weak heart moment that I just at that moment may go back to Egypt and regret it. In that moment I may go back to an old lifestyle and regret it. I said how to make it pass a weak heart moment. I said first of all, make sure that there's no Egypt to go back to. Then I said second of all, make sure you strengthen your relationship with the word of God and the church. And then third of all, look at it, verse 40. Saying unto Aaron... Make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, look at it, look at it, we want not what has become of him. Do you know the number one reason why people fall out of church? Is because their spiritual leader falls out of the ministry. The number one reason why people fall out of church is because their spiritual leaders, they look around and they say, where are they at? The hardest day you'll ever wake up to is the day that whoever led you spiritually to this point is no longer around to lead you spiritually to the next point. And then you and I will find out Will we go back to Egypt or will we keep going forward? There are a lot of people when they find out that their leader's feet are made of clay and their leader's feet stink and they're human, there are a lot of Christians who go, well, fine. If the pastor's going to act that way, then I'm done with God and I'm done with church. Let's just go back to Egypt. It was the number one thing. Why? Because they woke up one day and they realized Moses has gone to the mount. We don't even know what's going on with Moses. That's fine. We're done. Let's go back to Egypt. But they turned in their heart at a weak moment. Listen very closely. That's why you burn the bridges to Egypt. And that's why you strengthen that relationship with the Lord. Because man will fail you. The arm of flesh will fail you. But God never fails fails you always look past the pulpit to the Lord always look past man and get your eyes on the Lord because if your eyes are not on the Lord then when you're disappointed listen to me not if when you're disappointed oh you and I could write a book could we not If you have lived any time at all, we could write a book about man's shortcomings. And in my book, you know who would be chapter 1 through 10? Are you ready? Me. And I better not be chapter 1 through 10 in your book. You better be chapter 1 through 10. Because the biggest disappointment I have is me. And I know even your pastor at times... My heart becomes very weak at a moment to where even your pastor realizes, are you ready? What if I would have pursued history and PE? But then I think to myself, what else am I going to do? The only thing I know to do is tell people about Jesus Christ. The other day I was in AutoZone. And the guy was like, you know, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I'm looking for something. So I told him what I was looking for. And he said, okay, so I'm down the aisle. Well, I got a tie on. And I'm down the aisle and I'm looking. And this guy walks up and said, can I help? Can you help me? Do you work here? And I thought to myself, yeah, I could help him. So I said, yes, sir, I can help you. What are you, what are you looking for? I'm a, I'm a master mechanic. <laughs> now, anybody knows me, I'm nothing. <laughs> uh, I don't even know which end of the car. Never mind. And uh, I, he said, yeah, can, can you help? I said, yes, sir. Wait, what do you need? I'm a master mechanic. He said, well, I'm looking for, and he named something, and I was like, that's great. That's wonderful. It's around here somewhere. And uh, sir, before, we, before I show you about your car, can I ask you about your soul? And he looked at me and said, you don't work here, do you? And I was like, 
No. What would I do? Even if I could go do something else, guess where it all come back to? Can I tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ? I would get fired from a job for working for God while I was making money for someone else. Listen very closely. You and I, at weak moments of our heart that we think this is not what I need to be doing, please listen to me. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Because if the Lord can bring you out of bondage, and if the Lord can part the Red Sea, and if the Lord can drown the enemy once, and if the Lord can bring you this far, guess what? He'll take you the rest of the way. I don't care who you are. There's going to come a moment on this journey. Will it be 50-something days into the journey like the children of Israel? I don't know. Will it be two years? I don't know. And by the way, could you do all of us a favor? I'm talking to myself right now. Don't, don't, don't spit in our food if we're enjoying life. You know, the worst thing could ever happen. Somebody's excited about the Lord and some old timer goes, well, you just be saved a little bit longer and you won't feel that way. You know, don't look at the person next to you that's singing for the top of their lungs because they love the Lord. To God be the glory. And you say, well, you just live longer and you won't feel that way. Don't, don't be that way. You and I must remember that we are on this journey. And when we get to that moment to where we truly feel like, oh my, I made a mistake. Just make it through that quitting point. Make it through that quitting point. And what you're going to find out, and if you'll do opposite of what the children of Israel did, and don't provoke the Lord, you know, God stopped them from going back to Egypt. But in their heart, they still wanted to go back. Let's not be that kind of church. Don't be that kind of Christian. Get past it. Let's get on the other side of it. Strengthen that relationship with the Lord. Burn the bridges back to Egypt. And remember this, although your spiritual leader may disappoint you at times, God never disappoints us. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time that we can spend together.